Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, attorney Lori McCall navigates the complexities of a software development agreement with some consulting promises built in. So let's tear it down. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. Today, I am here with my friend Lori McCall. Lori, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. I am glad to be with you because we are going to talk about something that is just confusing me. And I like when things make me scared and confused. It's it's, okay. it's a psychosis I'm working with my therapist on. Uh, we're talking about this document. I'm going to share it with the folks at home. It's called a Software Development and Consulting Agreement between Reminderbox and Tim Miller of Atreides LLC. So you didn't know this, but we're going Dune themed uh, with this particular contract. Lori, what is a software development and consulting agreement? When are we going to see this kind of thing? Well, specifically in this context of the contract, which we'll obviously get into more specificity, I'm not sure in this context. So, But generally speaking, a software development agreement tends to focus specifically on just that, software development. There is a a specific itemization of work product that somebody is looking for, and you hire somebody who's a developer who can meet those criteria. Um, a consulting agreement is a little broader and can involve um, really anything you need consulting on. What I have seen in my experience is that oftentimes you can see a combined effort of consulting and software development, where a consultant might be an expert in a particular area of software and would come in and consult with the client on, okay, what are your current operations? What are you trying to accomplish in general? Let's talk about some different ways we can go about it. And then ultimately from that derive a statement of work or some sort of definition of the software to be developed as a result of that consultation. Perfect. Uh, Lori, I'm a simple man and I like to know who I'm dealing with. I I really love in contracts, the capital letters so that I know what is a word that matters in this document. I'm seeing the word consultant a lot and we're, you're, you're, we're going to see a theme here mm-hmm. that you just touched on. There were combining sort of software development, which is very defined services and consulting agreement, which is super vague. But on that theme, there's a company called Atreides and there's a dude called Tim. Right. And I can't tell in this document who's doing what. Is Atreides doing the company software development predictable stuff and Tim's doing the consulting and looking pretty in the corner and writing <laughs> four part matrices on the whiteboard Maybe. which is what all consultants do what, what's going on here who are we talking well, about well that's an excellent question and that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to look at this contract because I do think having that specificity of who, your co- who the contracting parties is is so important keeping in mind the real need for a contract isn't during the entire life of the relationship. It really comes into play if there's a dispute or controversy or somebody doesn't understand what's supposed to happen. So the point of the contract really is you wanna ensure that the services that are gonna be performed are gonna be really well-defined. And when you when it's not clear even who the contracting parties are and who's responsible for providing the services, that's one you know additional confusion to add. So with this contract specifically, we do define Tim Miller of our Atreides as being uh, apparently an employee of that company. And then we defined consult, we defined consultant probably as, t- as Tim Miller, maybe as our Atreides, it's unclear. Um, and a better way to do this would simply define it as the consultant is the company you're hiring who will then assign a specific named contractor if that's what you're looking for. So here throughout this document, if you, if you scan through it, you'll see, um, the, the terms interchange between consultant or tradies and Tim Miller. So it is a little confusing because, and, and this can also lead to other problems as far as who's granting what warranties. Is it coming from an individual human or is it coming from a company? And generally you're going to want the company because they're going to have the deeper pockets and be who you're going to want to pursue if there's a breach. Let's talk about uh, what Tim slash Atreides slash consultant is going to do in in this particular contract. Under one consulting services, right. it says is requested by client, the, the hiring company, and agreed to by presumably Tim from time to time, whether in writing, by purchase order, or verbally. Tim's going to provide consulting and software development services on a time and expenses right. basis, according to the terms of his agreement. So this is a very agile 
you know, software development agreement. They're saying, I don't know how long it's going to take you. We're going to give you a job and you're going to do it. It says the primary purpose of this engagement is to continue the computer programming development of a mobile marketing software application and SMS gateway. So Mm. in the services, they're given a broad context. This is what we're trying to accomplish. And then they're saying, we're going to hire you however the heck that we want to. I'm not seeing in this the typical, you know, mission scope and the scope of work and right. the creeping of the scoping. <laughs> what are you seeing in the definition of services that you like and don't like? Maybe maybe you want it vague, maybe you don't. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Vagueness isn't necessarily in and of itself a bad thing, provided that the rest of the terms of the contract support that. So in that context, you would be creating more of a master services agreement or an MSA, in which event you could have the services defined vaguely at the outset with the concept written into the document of having work orders, statements of work, lots of different terminology you can use that are attached you know, mutually agreed to on a project by project basis that would then include the specificity of what is to be developed and hopefully would also include specific milestones for deliverables, um, you know, payments relative to those milestones and or deliverables. Um, And it would have, you know, what's the functionality? You would have language around acceptance if you're willing to agree or want acceptance as part of your language, especially with software development. That's really important because, you know, you have to get it installed and you got to get it up and working. Otherwise, there's really no value to your company if, if it doesn't operate properly. So so vagueness in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, in this contract, particularly, it does say it's on a time and materials basis. But if you look down at co- paragraph three, it also talks about a continuing payment of 9000 monthly. And so there's a payment and a substantial payment to be made to this company on a monthly basis that doesn't appear to be based on any time or materials or hours or anything else or milestones or deliverables or really anything. It's just a flat fee. You know, obviously this creates problems. It creates confusion within what the contract is trying to accomplish, but it also has a lot of ancillary implications long term, like is this person truly a contractor or are we paying this person a salary of some sort? And that can really trip us into, you know, we're looking for a consultant arm's length relationship. And ultimately we might be creating an employment relationship if we're, if we're paying this person certain amounts, which, you know, we move into other issues, tax issues and employment issues and whatnot. So. Yeah. Tim's got a lot of power. Apparently. Here. I, I'm even looking down at payment. Yeah. It says within 10 days after the services are provided, right? right? Not necessarily billed, that the client's going to pay for the invoice services rendered and reasonable expenses incurred on behalf right. of the client. So like 10 days, he could theoretically invoice on the ninth day and they have to right. pay the tip. That's a quick turnaround. Uh, Tim seems to have <laughs> a lot of power. <laughs> Apparently, Tim does have a lot of power. And if you're Tim... Bravo, I suppose. You're you're getting substantial payment for no defined terms and potentially additional payments for services that you have determined are needed and aren't otherwise defined. So but if you're the company and you're the one purchasing the services, um, I don't see this ending well. Yeah, I want to make a joke about uh, a Dune related joke about everybody being afraid of the House of Atreides, but you wouldn't get the joke. So we're going to move on. Uh, if I go down to uh, number five, it talks about warranties and limitations. Uh, so the client, the the person who's hiring Tim, is saying that they have all the rights to the software tools that are being used and that the work product presumably that Tim's creating won't infringe on it. So client is owning Tim's work, I guess, not breaking things. And then Tim and B is saying, everything will be fine. I'm not going to break anything. And then C just says, nobody's promising anything else. What do you think about these warranties and limitations? Well, a few things. I think first it's unclear the way they start off saying the client is warranting something on behalf of the consultant that Tim Miller will have the appropriate right title and interest. I'm wondering, was that a typo? Should it have been our tradies Mm -hmm. or the consultant is warranting that they are going to have the appropriate right title to the products they use in developing the software for the customer. Um, But it does say client. So reading it plainly within the, you know, four corners of the contract, I see the client warrants. So there's an implication there that The client is providing some sort of base software tools from which um, Tim Miller will 
continue to develop or add on to. Um, and again, not not in and of itself a problem, um, other than when you get down to transfer of ownership and you're looking at paragraph six and it's talking a lot about um, who owns what along the way. Uh, one of the things that's really important in a software development agreement is, is work made for higher language. So when you're developing a mm -hmm. customized software for somebody um, and the expectation is that the client who's paying for the development will own the software, the language really needs to be crystal clear. And this is really an important point. And the work made for hire it quotes, that's an important phrase to put in any one of these development contracts to ensure as the client, what you're getting is, is something you own. And you can, you know, arguably you can take a perpetual license, you know, royalty free license. However, then that gives the consultant the ability to then repurpose that software for others as well. And if you're paying for it, you want to own it. On the consultant side, yeah. I, sorry, I, sorry. I was going to say I'm, I'm I'm thinking about that in six. I, I think a theme that we're seeing here is, I mean, if you were to ask me, this is two agreements in mm -hmm. one, and a lot of the assumptions that you're talking about behind software development, that's a work for hire type agreement, and a consulting agreement is, I own everything. I'm just applying right. it to your situation. Am I am, am I seeing that confusion right in this transfer? Of yes, and I think I think the critical thing first and foremost is always going to be in the initial discussions before you even paper a contract. Right, the most critical thing is going to be making sure that both parties are on the same page because, to the consultant's point of view, they're bringing knowledge and expertise that makes them hireable as a consultant. You're not going to hire somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. So you want to ensure as a, from the consultant slash software developer, and again, we're blending those two together, you, you want to ensure that the knowledge and expertise that you're bringing to the table, you, you retain it and you own it, and you can repurpose those processes and that information, while the client is going to own the particular software piece that inevitably comes up. And, you know, with ownership of software, it's not, you know, you, you can hold up a, a disc and say, I own this software. Well, that's different. I mean, software isn't a good, it's more and more custom development, particularly is more and more considered a service. You wanna make sure what's really critical behind that is the intellectual property rights. So that goes back to ensuring work made for hire and copyrights are transferred. And um, all that language is very specific in the contract to make those intentions crystal clear. But, but, for, but you're right, from a consulting perspective, that consultant wants to be able to retain what makes them charge whatever they charge for their services. Well, relatedly, uh, going down to seven and confidential information. So Tim is coming into this conversation. He's going to do a lot of work for these people. He's going to run into some of their stuff. He's going to learn some things. And there's all these rules about he's got to keep it to himself right. for two years unless it was made public. How does that which again probably makes sense for developing mm -hmm. software. How does that work in this context where it's somebody taking knowledge into the right. future? What do you think about seven? Yeah, I think I think again another paragraph that really could have been fleshed out a little bit more to make it clear what the intent of the parties are or is. Um, I think that ultimately to be able to say that any confidential information that the company provides. So let's say in going into the development, the company is looking for a very specific workflow process and for software to be developed in a certain way. And that process will give them a competitive advantage against their, you know, the, the competition out there. They want to make sure that's theirs and that the consultant can't then take that and share it with their next customer who might be a competitor. So I think from that perspective, it's very, very reasonable to, to have a confidentiality obligation on the consultants, you know, but, kind of going back to the last point, to the extent that what is really being developed is knowledge and expertise and an understanding of, of general generic workflow processes, that is the kind of thing that the consultant would need to ensure they can take with them. And again, it's really important to be specific about what those things are and whether or not you're going to label things confidential, make it clear. And if you're going to speak to the confidentiality, you'll reduce it to writing afterwards and make it very, very clear that this was intentionally confidential. So do not share it with anybody else. Those types of criteria are really important. One other thing I wanted to point out that I don't think this is necessarily just true of software development agreement, but it's true in any context of a confidentiality obligation. Um, and one thing a lot of folks, um, avoid 
or don't necessarily think about. But something that's really important is to the extent any trade secrets are being disclosed, ensuring those are excluded from any cutoff of the confidentiality obligation. So oftentimes we'll see, you know, they'll maintain confidentiality for two years or five years with the assumption that within that time period, that information no longer gives the company a competitive advantage. So it's no longer comp shouldn't be held confidential. But trade secrets, as long as they're held as trade secrets and, you know, very rare circumstances to share trade secrets with anybody. But if you ever do, make sure you carve that out as being in perpetuity, the confidentiality obligation. Hmm. All right, let's step back okay. because something feels off here okay. and I don't know if we care. And, <laughs> and here's what I mean okay. by that. It, it, this is a weird context and, and, and it, this seems actually well adapted to the gig economy mm -hmm. that basically, historically, workers have had a bunch of rights that were tied to the role of being an employee. And now we're in this space mm -hmm. where neither employers nor employees a lot of times, you know, workers, they don't want to be employed. They, right. they don't want that relationship. They want a flexible relationship, but they still want all the protections right. that look a lot like an employee. So what I'm seeing in this is that they're trying to strike that balance mm -hmm. where th they have this gig. It is, you know, it's a consultant, it's outside, it's work for hire, but they're doing a lot of things that are giving this Tim fella the kind of power that we normally get out of protected employment relationships. Talk to me about what they're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. Is Do you see it that way? Is there a better way to do mm -hmm. that? Should, you know, sh in a sort of gig relationship like this, where it's kind of an agile project and when it's done, it's done. Should we keep these things separate? Can we put in their employment type protections? What, what are you seeing out of that sort of in the big picture? Yeah, um, it's definitely an issue. And the issue is it's not something you can necessarily contract around. And I know um, there's a, a preference to say, well, this is what the contract says and we have all agreed to it and we all still agree to it. Therefore, therefore, this is what it is. You know, that the provision like that and, you know, specifically would be, you know, this is a we're in a consulting or a, I'm sorry, a contractor relationship. Um, this is not an employment relationship, et cetera. However, when you start building in provisions into a, an agreement, whatever type, when you start building in provisions that appear to be more sort of things that an employee would do, and on top of that, have terms around that that support that, for instance, the $9,000 a month payment, but there's no defined services. That starts sounding more like a salary than a consultative arrangement where it's pay for services. It sounds much more like, okay, well, that's what you would do with an employer, employee, you pay them a salary. And there's a lot of other terms like this. The problem is that um, the determination of consultant versus employee is all, and I'm sure everyone can think back to law school, it's all around the issue of control and whether or not the hiring entity has control over what the third party is doing. And if they do have control, then you're tripping into what looks like an employment situation. There's a motivation on the part of the IRS. They have different balancing tests they can use, but fundamentally they'll go through their checklist and they'll say, well, I know you say you're a consultant and you're not an employee, but check, check, check. You're doing all these things that really make you look like an employee. And therefore, guess what? You're an employee, whether or not you don't want it, whether or not you want to be. Now, does that mean you have an obligation as the person who's now being called an employee to behave like an employee? No. But what happens is the company now suddenly is looking at going back and paying Social Security taxes and potentially offering retroactive benefits to this person. You know, again, people are looking people, you know, certain agencies are looking for ways to, you know, get those taxes out. And you can imagine if you had any company where you just could randomly call every employee now a consultant and, and not be responsible for those taxes and just pass all that off, that would be a problem. So um, that's yeah. something you have to consider when when creating these contracts. Yeah, the freedom to contract got a little complicated around 1900 when we invented the corporation and the administrative state at the same time. Uh, so Great super point. interesting. I, I appreciate you bringing this to us, Lori. It's, it's a really interesting context. Uh, for people who want to reach out to you and learn more about your work and how you think about documents yeah. like this, what's the best way to connect with you online? I'm on LinkedIn under Lori McCall. And yeah, that's the best way to reach out to me, message me anytime. 
Cool. Uh, we'll have that information and a link to this document uh, over at lawinsider.com slash resources. Also, if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show, feel free to email me. I am at uh, community at lawinsider.com. We would love to have you. Lori, thank you again for joining us. Thank and you. for the rest of you, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.